privacy and pedestrian learning. He has a long and extensive work of uh, research in this and publications in this field. And also he did a great uh, work uh, that is published last year with uh, prominent researchers in pedestrian learning. Uh, she will, he will talk about it uh, maybe, but uh, basically that work that was published last year, so far it's only received, within a year, it only received 2,500 citations, which is a basically great seminal work on further learning and in open questions and its applications. So with that, I'm going to welcome Dr. Kiruz and please uh, start your talk. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the warm introduction and uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, I'm missing out, but uh, I'm happy that I'm able to present to all of you today. Um, all right, so today I wanted to talk about mostly differential privacy um, in the context of federation and federated techniques. So there's not going to be a lot of focus on applications, not on finance. So hopefully this is going to be a bit of a break from the other talks. Um, but a lot of the techniques that we are going to see are very related to finance applications. Before going into DP and FL, uh, I wanted to overview the three privacy principles that we recently discussed in an ACM um, of the communications uh, paper. Um, those three principles are data minimization, anonymization, transparency, consent, and verifiability. So data minimization is about only collecting the data that is needed for a specific computation, limiting access at all stages of the pipeline and processing individuals data as early as possible and discarding any collected data or metadata and even processed data as soon as possible. So this is known as minimal retention. Um, the second principle, which is data anonymization. And here the term anonymization is aligned with European privacy laws and regulations uh, is about you know, ensuring that the final released output of the computation does not reveal anything unique to an individual that participated in the computation. So it means that aggregate statistics, including model parameters, whether released to an engineer or on a device and beyond, they should not vary significantly or at all based on whether any particular user data was included in the aggregation. So that's going to be very closely related to differential privacy. And then finally, the third principle ensures that the users of a product or a service understand exactly and the proof of the ways in which their data is going to be used. And more importantly, they have techniques, provable techniques that allow them to verify any claims that are made on the data minimization or anonymization front. So they can either verify them or falsify them. And a lot of times you're going to hear about things like zero knowledge proofs, you're going to hear about secure enclave with attestation, so on and so forth. These all are related to consent, verifiability, and falsifiability. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on the first two principles and I'll start with the first one. And on this front, I'm going to present federated learning as a technique that's actually by design a data minimization technology. So what is federated learning? It's a paradigm where clients think of them as banks, financial institutions, hospitals, phones, IoT devices at home, anything you want. They want to collaborate together to train a model, a joint model on their data. They do it via a server. So under the orchestration of a central service provider, they don't exchange immediate information together or with the server. So their raw data is actually always stored on their devices, never exchanged. And they immediately only send focused minimal updates that are intended for immediate aggregation. So the process actually is lengthy. It goes back and forth in many, many rounds, usually on the order of thousands of rounds. It takes days to train a model and it can be combined with a lot of other technologies as we will see in this talk. So as Sahar mentioned at the beginning, you can um, read a lot about this paradigm in the advances and open problems in federated learning, which recently appeared in foundations and trends in machine learning. So why do we think of it as a data minimization technology? Because as you can see on this slide, there's 
a lot of the data minimization principles being applied at all the stages of the technology. We minimize data exposure because we never exchange data across devices. We only send focused minimal updates. These are the model updates rather than the raw data back to the service. Uh, the service provider only uses ephemeral updates. So we strip off all attributes. Everything is end-to-end -end encrypted. And we immediately aggregate these updates. And we only release either the final model or a few models that are trained on a few hyperparameters. And at the end of the day, we only make a final single deployment. So you can see there's data reduction and minimization at all stages of the technology. Now you can further extend and rigorize the uh, guarantees on the data minimization front. And I'll talk about it in a bit, but first I'll show you the uh, main algorithm that we use under federated learning. This is known as the federated averaging algorithm, where what we do is we run multiple steps of stochastic gradient descent locally on a user device. So we take one full pass or maybe a number of passes on the local data set. And then we take the updated model and we send it back. When we send it back, we aggregate it across a number of clients. And the server now computes a weighted average. For now, we're going to look at it as a weighted average. When we talk about differential privacy, we're going to actually say that we need to do something that's unweighted. Um, and that's how we get a new model on the server. So this is something that's iterated thousands of times. And it's as simple as that. There's averaging on the server, there's stochastic gradient descent on the client. And that's known as uh, FEDAV. Since the publication of FEDAF in 2017, there's been lots of progress in this space. So many different versions of uh, improved optimization techniques in this setting. And so um, I'm not going to dive into all the flavors of how people used Adagrad and Adam and Yogi and all kinds of optimization algorithms, but uh, you can find them all on archive. So I was saying that we could strengthen the data minimization guarantees and one way is to bring cryptographic technologies and secure hardware technology. So for instance, end-to-end uh, -end encryption at rest or on the wire is one way in which we could ensure that anybody spying on the links does not actually read the content of these messages that are being exchanged back and forth. Another one such technique that we use widely at Google is multi-party computation to do a form of secret sharing or secure aggregation to ensure that the server can only see the sum of the updates that are sent rather than the individual updates from the clients. You could also think about trusted execution environments with remote attestation, so on and so forth. These are all forms of data minimization because they reduce the data that a server can actually see. So as I mentioned, secure aggregation is one such technology. I'll touch on it a bit. Um, but it, it's, it's a cryptographic protocol. It allows the server to obtain the sum of high dimensional ve vectors of client held data in a way that ensures that the server only learns just the sum and no individual data whatsoever. So I'm not going to go into the details of how this secret sharing based protocol works. There's a lot of uh, interesting details that you can read in the papers that I'm referring to on this slide, but I want you to know that this is something that actually runs in production, it runs at scale, um, and it's actually robust to dropouts and other things as well. And so we're going to touch on it a bit in the second half of this talk. So just keep it in mind. With that, I'm going to switch to data anonymization where much of the talk is going to focus. And I'm going to present differential privacy. So I'm hoping that most of you have seen it, have used it. Um, differential privacy is a way to quantify to what extent a computation that's done on a database has overfitted to an individual user's data. So ideally, if you take two neighboring databases that are different in a single row, and you apply the same query on both, and you look at the outputs of those two queries that you applied on the two neighboring data sets, you kind of want the distribution of the outputs to be fairly close to one another. Because if they are very close to one another, an adversary would not be able to distinguish whether an output was coming from a data set D or D prime. Now, one way to measure statistical distance between distributions is as shown on the bottom of this slide. This is in the literature of information theory known as max divergence or infinite divergence. 
And it's quantified by two parameters, epsilon and delta. And as you can see, we want epsilon and delta to be as close to zero as possible because that indicates that these two distributions are very close to one another. And therefore, privacy is large. In practice, we use delta, which is something very, very small. It's cryptographically small. Think of it as 10 to the negative 6 or 10 to the negative 9 or something like that. We would love epsilons to be in the single digit regime, but there's a lot of discussion and debate about how to set these epsilons. And one thing to be uh, very uh, upfront about is the notion of adjacency in this definition of differential privacy. Um, and this is going to dictate the unit of privacy. And we love to use what's called user level privacy. And what that means is that when you go from a data set D to D prime, you're not just changing one single training example, you're changing all the training examples that belong to a single individual user. And that's why it's user level DP because D and D prime do not differ by one training example, but all the training examples of a user. This is definite, definitely much stronger than example level differential privacy, but this is the one that we believe fits very nicely with federated learning, where we're giving protections at the client levels or the user level. Now you might think, okay, how do I apply it to the federated averaging algorithm that we saw earlier in the talk? And it's actually easy. All you have to do is train on device by doing the SGD steps. Afterwards, take the model update that you're going to send back to the server, clip it, and this clipping is an L2 clipping. So you make sure that the L2 norm is bounded. And this in a sense limits the contribution of every client to the aggregate that's going to be computed on the server. And as I said before, instead of doing weighted aggregation, we're going to limit the weight that any clipped client update can make in this uh, aggregate. And usually we set it to one, so we actually do unweighted aggregation. And at the end of the day, the server ends by adding Gaussian noise to the aggregate. This is important because without it, we cannot prove differential privacy. Now, you can see it's easy to uh, apply differential privacy to FL. What's not so easy is how to compute the epsilons and how to track the epsilons across many iterations of the algorithm. As I said, we're going to run it for thousands of iterations. In particular, one very important component of applying differential privacy to federated averaging is what's known as amplification via sampling, where because each client device participates with a probability Q, this gives a boost in the privacy guarantee that allows us to give good privacy accuracy trade-offs. And so it's important and critical to hide who participated in which rounds and to ensure that the participation in every round is random according to this probability Q. In the data center applications, it's very easy to say we're sampling these clients or records with probability Q. In the federated context, there's a lot of challenges to do that, and we'll see them in a bit. But as you can see on this slide, for an expert prediction model on the Stack Overflow data set, if we compare the performance of the amplified DP federated averaging to the unamplified DP federated averaging, we're going to see a big, big gap. If we don't use this technique, amplification via sampling, we're going to lose a lot of accuracy. So for instance, look at epsilon equals four on this plot. We can get about an accuracy of 18%, which is actually quite good for that epsilon when we use amplification via sampling. And when we do not use amplification via sampling, this number drops to something that's fairly close to 14%. So we're losing a lot of the accuracy. Now, why can't we use it in FL? Because the clients are not available in all the rounds and are not addressable by the server. So it's hard or even impossible to uniformly sample clients from the underlying population. The population itself can be changing. There are rounds where there could be very few online devices. There are rounds where there could be a lot more online devices. So it's actually very difficult to do these kinds of uh, uniform sampling style techniques and get the boost in the privacy. So we need to rethink things if we want to prove formal epsilons and get good privacy accuracy trade-offs. And let's think about it from first principle by deconstructing the model training. 
So this is the simple you know, way of updating the model. In this case, we're representing it by theta. And you can see that if we start from initial model theta zero, what's going to happen in the first round uh, is that we're going to take all the users, these are the orange users that showed up in round one, and we're going to aggregate their updates to get gradient zero. And we're going to update the model from theta zero to theta one as shown on the slide, it's easy. Now, in the second round, we have our theta one, and we're going to broadcast it, and we're going to get updates from the users that showed up in the second round. And now we're going to get G1, which is the aggregate of all the model updates on the blue users. And if you look at how we're updating model theta one to obtain theta two, it's simply, if you unroll it a little bit, it's going to look like G0 plus G1. And you can do this for a number of steps. You can keep on taking new users and taking their updates, aggregating them to get a new gradient, and then look at how the model is updated. And you'll notice a pattern emerges very quickly, which is that at each step around, the model update can be written as a prefix sum of the gradients across all the tra training rounds. So this is where the idea of estimating a prefix sum becomes important. And these obviously gradients across rounds are highly dependent. So there's some sort of interactivity in the way we're computing them. So we should not ignore that, but it's, it's a simplifying assumption to look at it as a continual observation problem, which was actually mentioned in the talk before. So with that in mind, if this is how we're looking at this problem, that it's a running online prefix sum problem, we can actually borrow techniques from the DP literature that are actually quite uh, mature at this point. So there's this protocol that's called the tree aggregation protocol that you may have seen it under the name of binary mechanism, which allows us to efficiently compute with differential privacy a running uh, sum. And again, you, you may have seen it under the title of continual observations or continual release of data. These are all very related. And this gives you all the partial sums of something that you see in an online fashion and you can form a federated optimization algorithm around it. And if you combine these techniques cleverly together, you will see that even without assuming any amplification via sampling, we could get a privacy trade-off curve. This is again for the same stack overflow data set and the same uh, next for prediction model, you can see that the privacy accuracy trade-off curve now exceeds the one that we can get without amplification via sampling in most regimes, even it exceeds the accuracy of the one under amplification via sampling in practically a lot of the regimes. And in specific for epsilon equals four, it gives us a performance that actually is a little better than using sampling. And this is all stemming from the fact that we are representing exactly what we need in the optimization. All right, so this is kind of in a nutshell how it works, the DPFDRL algorithm. You bound user contribution again, you have to clip, and you bound the participation of a user. You say, for instance, a user cannot participate more than once every 24 hours. And then finally, on the server, you do something that's fancy. You apply this tree aggregation protocol, which is a stateful aggregation with DP. Um, and you know you run the training algorithm roughly on Peter, may I ask you a question? OK, sorry. I thought you couldn't hear me from there. Um, can you clarify again what it means uh, sampling? What do you mean by sampling? Yes, of course. So, so if I go back a few slides, um, we said that one technique to um, get improved accuracy privacy trade-offs is to sample the client devices in every round. So in federated averaging, we're going to run for a thousand of rounds. In every round, we're going to compute on a slice of the devices from the population that slice of the devices that we're going to see, which is represented under this green ellipse in, the, in, this, uh, in this slide, um, these devices, they are somehow sampled from the population. Ideally, we would love to sample them uniformly at random. So we want to pick each one of them statistically with probability Q, exactly Q. And we know this Q and we can control it. But in practice, it's actually very difficult to do something like that. 
um, especially in uh, applications where you have millions or billions of phones and you're training on all of them across thousands of rounds. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Sounds good. All right, um, going to go back. Feel free to interrupt me if you have questions, uh, if there's anything that is not clear. So yeah, so we're going to use this tree aggregation protocol. Um, this has led us to training and production with this technique. So we've re recently trained a, a language model. It's a recursive neural network with 1.3 million parameters um, for the Google uh, Spanish language uh, G boards. Uh, we ran it for 2000 rounds over six days. And in every round, we had a participation report goal of 6,500 devices. And we ensured that no device can participate more than once in every 24 hours. So during the course of training, a device cannot show up more than six times be because we trained for six days. And we were able to not only give very good privacy guarantees, but we were able to also show improved model quality compared to the prior work. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first production training of neural network directly on user data with a precise and formal DP guarantee. You can read more about it in the blog post that I'm linking on the slide. Um, but what I wanted to highlight more importantly is that for a DP launch like this one, it's important to be very clear about a few things. First of all, the scope of the privacy guarantee to you know, whom does it apply? In this case, the guarantee applies to all uses of undevised data for training of a single model. And then the unit of privacy, this is again related to the user level kind of definition of adjacency of data, data sets. And the trust assumption, so in this case, we assume that there is the trusted aggregator that actually applies the stateful noise from the tree aggregation protocol. So it does this differential privacy uh, technique. And the DP guarantee itself, uh, we gave a ZCDP guarantee, which is a 0 0.81. We could translate it to a DP guarantee where you would get an 8.9 for the epsilon and a delta of 10 to the negative 10. Um, the epsilon can get a little better if you relax your delta. And then finally, we've open sourced all our code so that it's inspectable and people can verify that we've done properly the implementation of the DP algorithm. So we advocate that whenever anybody talks about a differential privacy launch, they at least touch on these, what we call nutritional uh, information for DP. All right, with the interest of time, I wanted to cover uh, how we could combine data anonymization and data minimization techniques to reduce the trust in the server. So how can we take DP and MPC and merge it together? Uh, there's uh, a lot of beautiful work that we've done that appeared in ICML and NURPS recently. So I invite you to check it out. But the idea is to actually use a form of discrete noise that is added on the device and then it meshes very nicely with secure aggregation to allow you to compute the sum. Um, and with that, you could get a form of distributed differential privacy guarantee so that you do not have to um, trust the server in adding the noise. The clients themselves will add the noise and we can match the guarantees that we could get with central DP. Um, we've recently also done some work to improve the communication efficiency. So I'll skip uh, that. And close with uh, two challenges that I think are interesting that pe people may want to work on. The first is uh, on auto-tuning the compression rate, um, where right now we're using a form of sketching to do compression. Sketching is a form of uh, sparse random projection. Uh, and this meshes very nicely with uh, cryptographic protocols like secure aggregation, multi-party computation techniques. Um, and because it's a linear compression technique, but there is a fundamental question here of how do we set the compression weight of this sketching protocol? If we set it too aggressively, then we're going to lose accuracy, as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide. And if we set it too loosely, we are perhaps losing a lot on saving bandwidth. 
And this is very important because as we continue to scale the models, today we're training tens of millions of parameters or even 100 million parameter models on people's devices. But as we continue to grow and scale that, we need to ensure that the bandwidth, both on the uplink and downlink, are reduced as much as possible. And so how do we select the compression rate in a smart, clever way on the fly is an open challenge. And this is something we invite researchers to work on. And then finally, how do we get a way of distributing this tree aggregation protocol is an open question. Um, I talked about this distributed DP, and this is just to simulate the DP FedAV algorithm that I presented earlier in the talk, how to take the stateful algorithm of DP FTRL based on tree aggregation and decentralize that with MPC remains an open question. We think that we can borrow techniques from fluid MPC and others in order to uh, tackle this challenge. So we invite you to work on this one as well. With that, I'll conclude my talk and thanks, uh, thank everyone for attending. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. So much, Peter, for a great talk. So let me check online if uh, there's any questions. So is there any questions on the person? Yes, there's a question. Yeah, so Peter, thank you for your talk. Uh, one question I have is what work is actually being done to make the DP guarantees actually be understandable to a user? So when you say like uh, an epsilon 8.9 delta 10 to negative 10, that means nothing to your average person. So uh, the nutritional label, I liked that a lot, but how do you make that uh, palatable for a user? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So, so um, the very nice thing about differential privacy is that it comes with an operational interpretation that uh, I don't know how familiar you are with these types of membership inference attacks. I think Matthew may have uh, presented on some of those earlier in this workshop, um, where what you could do is you could translate the epsilon guarantee of DP to an attack, an actual attack that you can do on the trained model. Um, so for example, you could say something like, if I train with an epsilon of blah, whatever blah is, eight or five or one or more or less, um, then any adversary that observes the model and tries to get whether or not your data was used in the training of the model, they will have a performance below this thing, whatever this thing is. You, you know, they, they will fail with a probability of x, where you can precisely compute x. Sure. And the very cool, sense. yeah. And the very cool thing is that you could either directly compute x from the epsilon and go with the worst case bounds the DP assumes under worst case data and worst case adversaries, or you can do what a lot of folks in the community do. You can actually try to empirically compute this probability of success. So you can uh, you can use uh, attacks and. This is just getting really, really nice. Uh, and, and they're improving by the day, these kinds of attacks. Yeah, sure, yeah, there is a whole question. Uh, the second question I had was, uh, so you one thing you didn't really touch on is the model updates going back to the client. Um, that seems like it would also represent a uh, privacy concern. So when do these model updates go back to the client and how, do they, uh, how is that process handled? Yeah, that's also a very good question. So, so in the in the uh, vanilla version of federated averaging and FL more broadly, um, indeed we do send the updates to the client. Uh, sorry, the updates to the server, um, and this may constitute a breach of privacy, as you have suggested. Um, this is because uh, federated learning is just a data minimization technology. It's not a data anonymization technology. Um, so this is anticipated and expected. I can take these updates, I can try to reverse engineer them, and I could try to extract potentially sensitive information from them. And there's a lot of beautiful papers, recent and old, that do that. Uh, so FL on its own is not going to give you data anonymization or differentially private kind of guarantees. You have to combine it. Um, so one way to, uh, to do it is, which is kind of how I present it in this talk, you trust a server in adding the noise. The other thing that you could do, which is what I briefly, briefly touched on at the end of the talk, which is you could decentralize the DP mechanism. So instead of relying on the server and adding the noise, you can take a cryptographic protocol such as secure aggregation 
and combine it with differential privacy by adding the noise locally on the device. What this ends up doing at the end of the day is it ensures that the server can only see a differentially private aggregate, so a noisy aggregate. It neither can see the individual gradients from the client or these updates from the client, nor can it see um, you know, just noisy single uh, updates. It sees aggregated noisy updates. Um, this is something we're pushing for in production. I cannot speak on which team is training with which technology, but our hope as a, you know, the federated learning team at Google is to have everybody get to a point where they could combine these kinds of technologies, MPC, DP, and also potentially uh, getting some increased trust from secure enclaves. Okay, so yes, so I guess that's all the questions. Let's one more question. Oh, boys, yeah. So one that is in production now, is it only the DP solution or both with the secure aggregation? Which one is in production? Sorry, sorry I, I cannot hear the question properly. She's asking, she's asking what you have in production. It is just a DP version or DP plus MPC and how, which, which version basically is in production? Yeah, so, so the, the, the one that I talked about in this talk, this launch is one that um, is a central DP. So there is no secure aggregation in it. The model that was launched and we blocked about it, the one that I presented on in this talk, is strictly you have to trust the server in adding the noise. Uh, so it's a central DP, there's nothing distributed in it, there's no secure aggregation, there's no NPC, there's no secure enclaves. Um, we are training and production with the combination of these technologies. We have not made an announcement yet, so hopefully soon we can talk about how we've combined them all in an actual production uh, launch. Um, that being said, I do want to emphasize one thing that I think is very important, which is that our server itself is reducing the surface of attack drastically because teams at Google, whether it's Gboard or Gmail or YouTube or any other team that works with us, they do not have access to the server. In fact, even on our team, very, very few members have access to the raw logs of the server. And this is actually quite important because it reduces the surface of attack from potentially thousands of engineers to tens of engineers, which is a drastic reduction. And so what the customers, those teams that have requested the model to be trained, what they see at the end of the day is just the differentially private trace of model iterates. And from that, you know, we have the DP guarantee. But of course, this requires trusting that the server is honest in the way it applies the algorithm. And this is where um, cryptographic techniques, secure hardware techniques allow us to relax some of these tr trust assumptions. So this is where a lot of our focus is on right now. Okay, great. So thank you so much. So let's thank Peter again. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Peter. So with that, we are going to actually conclude our workshop. So Daniel and I organized this workshop together for the first time. So Daniel, go ahead. You yeah, know, just thank you very much for attending. It's like a great effort just to come back to in-person conferences and we hope to see you again in future events, right? Of course, yes. Yeah. So we'd like to actually uh, give a summary of this today workshop, which basically we try to organize this workshop in a way that we have between the first session and the first lunch, we are having prominent researchers giving a, like talks, like invited talks for this. We are gonna set the bar for the future events. So starting with Ellen, she talked about blockchain and decentralized finance. Marcel talked about how he constructed a library for computing machine learning uh, with multi-party secure computation. Ludwig talked about quantum computing. Uh, Matthew talked about adversarial machine learning. Peter also talked about privacy and predator learning. And Antigone actually gave a great example of how we can combine these three, like security privacy, AI, into finance applications by giving the concrete um, application scenario and we are in production uh, in our Jacob Market Bank. So with that, I'm going to basically invite everybody to attend our future events. And I would like to invite researchers from academia, like professors, students, and researchers from industry to basically send us their um, their work for the future events, for the submissions, for it. So thanks everyone for attending and- Thanks to speakers too, of course, and yeah. see you next time. <laughs> see you next year, thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you guys. <laughs>
Thank you, Peter. Have a great day and have a great summit. <laughs> Thank you, Little Big and the Moon Sustain. Thanks, everyone online. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. Yeah. They close the meeting now, is it? Yeah, let me just stop recording. Yeah.